How's it going guys? It's ABSC Blogger here now. Today, welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be looking at Aston Villa's top 10 most expensive signings. Yes guys, that's right. Today I'm going to be looking at Aston Villa's top 10 most expensive signings. I'm going to be looking at their facts and statistics at Villa. I'm going to be talking about their performances at Villa and I'm going to be giving my opinions on that player. If you guys could smash the like button on this video, that would be much appreciated. There's a lot of effort uh, and a lot of research and just to make this video as best as possible gone into this video so if you guys could like the video that would be that would be the least you can do because it means a lot more than you guys think anyway without further ado let's get into the first player so guys the first player we're going to be talking about and the 10th most expensive signing in the whole of the greatest football club in england is going to be matt target Matty Target's a bit of a weird one. We signed him for £11.5 million. We signed him on the 1st of July 2019. And of course, we did sign him from Southampton. And he plays at the position, which is left back. Matty Target is a bit of a weird one because, of course, he still plays in the Villa squad now. And he's a regular starter at Villa. Uh... He, we signed him from Southampton in July. He graduated through the academy. I think he first went to the academy when he was eight years old. And I think he made 40 to 50 appearances, something like that, for Southampton. So, of course, he was a pretty key player of Southampton. We picked him up in July. And as I keep saying, it's a bit of a weird signing. Matt Target is a really inconsistent player. And I think most Villa fans can agree on that. One minute, he's having a blind of the game. And he's the best left back you've ever seen. And one minute, he's having an absolute shocker. So he has his games where, against like Leicester in the Carabao Cup him and Grealish's link of play it was a very 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 good they were just like passing it up the whole way at the pitch Grealish fed in Target who put it in in the bottom right past Michael which made it 1-0 to Villa against Leicester and stuff like that you know sometimes his link of play with Grealish is superb you know you always see Grealish and Target putting stuff on their Instagram about each other they've got a good friendship and when he plays like he did against Leicester uh, linking up with Grealish and playing really well he's such a good left back but then you get times where he's, he's just absolutely horrible to watch to be honest in the league he's only scored one goal for Villa this season being a pretty important goal against Brighton slight one in absolute limbs at Villa Park and that was a very big result in uh in this season but he's Villa's 10th most expensive signing and as a player I don't mind him if he just if he just like plays good every game he'd be a much better player right guys so the next most expensive player there's a few of them there's about four I think that have signed for 12 million pounds for Villa but we're going to be talking about someone who I have a lot to say about. So the next player is a very hit and miss player in Ross McCormack, who signed for £12 million. We signed him on the 4th of August 2016. We signed him from Fulham and he scored three goals in 20 games for Villa. This guy... Oh, I've got a lot to say about him. The season before he signed for Villa, he played for Fulham. And in, uh, he played 45 games in all competitions that season and scored 18 goals. It's like one goal in every two games, which is a, for, which I think is a very good goal ratio. And when he came to Villa, I think it was at the start of his Villa career, there was a big issue that every Villa fan knows about. He lived near Bodymore Heath uh, in Tamworth or Kingsbury, which is the Villa training ground. Uh, his car broke down as he was leaving for training. Ross McCormack as well has a, has a three foot fence going all around his house so you know easy to jump over and instead of calling someone to say you know please can you pick me up to come training or instead of him jumping over the fence and jogging or running or walking whatever he just stayed at home and didn't turn up to train him. Of course, Steve Bruce is very, very annoyed at this and obviously, and so was all the Villa fans because it's not like he lived the opposite side of the country. I think he lived like a 20 minute, half an hour walk from the Villa training ground. So the Villa fans and Steve Bruce didn't really, didn't really have much hope in McCormack and I think towards the end of his Villa career, I think he got done for like drink driving or something like that. So, you know, that kind of really ended his career. But personally, despite what he did with that training thing, I really like the player. For Villa, McCormack was one of those players who doesn't score loads of goals, but when he plays well, he creates chances. He gets the ball down, he passes it off, which obviously explains that he's only got three goals in 20, 20 games for Villa. I really liked him because I feel, I feel, from what I remember, he was a very energetic striker on his day. He was either a fat lump at front, he just got brought off all the time, or he was an energetic striker that was trying to create chances. 
He also had a lot of hype before he came to Villa because he did so well for Fulham over a couple of seasons. And then at Villa, obviously, the training the training thing happens, uh, the issue. And then that kind of ruined his career already at Villa. And that was at the start of his career. But when he did start getting back to play, and obviously Jonathan Codger, every single Villa fan knows he is the most annoying player ever and does not pass the ball. Codger was so greedy that McCormack was getting annoyed. And I, I read something that they were having like arguments in training. And they really weren't getting on. And then when McCormack finally scored the goal every Villa fan was happy for him because you know why not it's his first goal in like 10 games but Nkodja just kind of strolled to the halfway line not even caring you know which I think that kind of drove uh, McCormack out uh, out of the club and by the end of you know the transfer window he kind of said you know I'm not happy here and I want to move and you know fair play to him he doesn't even have a club at the minute I think he's only 32 or 33 or something like that he doesn't even have a club he could have such a big potential but such a hit and miss player and I kind of feel bad for him despite what he did the next player who I have a lot to say about again in Scotty Hogan which is like right guys just interrupt the video I have been a nominated a finalist in the football blogging awards I'm sure you guys know what this is, but if you don't head over to my previous video on my YouTube channel to know all the details, but basically guys, click the link at the top of the description, it'll be right at the top of the description, scroll down to best young content creator, go to the second bar, go to AVSC Vlogger and vote for me guys, it would mean the absolute world. Also, once, once you've done that, send me photos on Instagram because I'll be replying to all of you and I might even give you a shout out. So please go do that, I'd mean the world. Anyway, enjoy the rest of the video. We signed him for 12 million on the 31st of January 2017. We signed him from Brentford and he's got six to and for Villa he had 10 goals in 61 games. Hogan again we just used him wrong. Bruce really did like did not play to his strengths whatsoever. He used to literally stick Hogan up front. He's a, he's a really small bloke Hogan is. He used to stick Hogan up front, give Hogan the ball and he just used to get bullied off the ball Hogan. It was like uh, I remember we had Lewis Graben that season obviously who was our main striker but we did play Hogan when Graben got injured and he was like a holding player we Bruce was using him as a holding player which is not how he plays like at Birmingham he's absolutely smashing it for Birmingham this season eight games and seven goals he won a player of the month and Birmingham threw ball Hogan will run onto it and he'll, he'll score most of the time we will use him as a holder player he's a small man he's not very tall he's not very strong sorry at all and we used him wrong. But Hogan, I think me and my mum were on our way to the Burton game. I think it was. It might not have been the Burton game. But we're on our way over. And I said to my mum, if we give Scott Hogan the chance, he will score. Just trust me. And he did. He scored that game. And, yeah, but there was a stage where Lewis Graben got injured. Hogan scored two goals. Versus, oh, no, a goal versus Forrest. And he played somewhere else where he scored two goals. And he was really getting the hype. And then he just dipped in form purely because we did not use him to his strengths. As I said, he's absolutely smashing it for Blues and I really do like Scott Hogan. And he left us for Sheffield United. Once again, did nothing for Sheffield United. He went to Birmingham and he's absolutely smashing it. Just shows how good of a striker he is. And if Steve Bruce would have used Hogan right, then he could have been a very good player. And the best uh, the best games that Hogan had was, like I said, when we played Forrest and he scored the only goal. Well, it was a through ball. Hogan ran onto it and he scored. When we beat Wolves 4-1, uh, you know, Hogan played really well. It's definitely the best game he's had in the Villa and I think one of his goals was like I said through ball goal right guys so the next player also signed for about 12 million pounds that's the main man Stuart Downing of course we signed Downing from Middlesbrough and for Villa Downing was a very key player I also know when Downing was playing for us that was the time where England didn't really have a left left right mid apparently they used to play like Paul Scholes at left mid so when Downing was at Villa that was a good time as he got a few England call-ups of course, I don't. Uh, I haven't seen Downing playing a Villa shirt, so I've got my granddad to send me a little clip. So uh, this one, my granddad thinks Stuart Downing. Midfielder, winger, came from Middlesbrough, 20, uh, 2009 2010 season, twelve million pounds. Yeah, played really well. Played seventy six games, scored eleven goals. Midfielder, played on the wing. I remember him playing right wing quite a lot. Good player, played out wide, could get the ball in. Um, I liked him. I, th I thought it was quite good. I think some fans were a bit fr fr frustrated with him from time to time, but I quite liked him. And in 2011, well, Liverpool turned up and gave us 20 million for him. So, you know, he had a reputation. I think he had a good play. Uh, I was trying to see him go. I, I really was. I thought he could have done a lot more for us. But you know what? You pay 12, you get 20. Maybe it was the right time. Uh, but he's, uh, he played well for Liverpool as well. He was a good, hard-working player.
Right guys, so the next player I'm going to be talking about is Ezri Konza. Once again, we signed Ezri Konza for about £12 million. We signed him on the 11th of July 2019 from the club Brentford FC and he scored one goal this season. Ezri Konza, of course, is a centre-back who plays at Villa right now and has a lot of potential and he's very young. He's 22 years old, has seven caps for the under-21 England team and has scored one goal. Uh, as I said, very, very big potential. Towards the middle of the season, we played five the back and Konza was a regular starter and since then he's been a regular starter in the starting lineup ever since that uh he scored one goal this season in the league which obviously was a very lucky deflection goal probably should have been Tyron Mings against Watford which was an absolutely crucial three points to be honest there isn't loads to say about Ezra Konza uh when Konza was at his previous club Brentford Smith obviously was managing uh Konza there so obviously he liked Konza so much that he's brought him back to Villa Park Con's a very good potential. We signed him for £12 million and he's on this list. Next player is a player who's an absolute legend in, in English football and an absolute legend for Liverpool. It's James Milner. I'm going to get Grandad to talk about James Milner, but I've got some stats for you guys about James Milner. We signed Milner for £12 million from Newcastle United on the 29th of August 2008. For Villa, he played 95 appearances and scoring 12 goals. I'm going to let Grandad do the talking about James Milner, but I've got some really good facts and statistics for, it, for you guys here. We signed him from Newcastle in 2008. Uh, he was very, very young when he signed for us and had a lot of potential and was getting the England call-ups at the time, around that time. Altogether in the Premier League, he's made 534 appearances altogether, scoring 55 goals. Obviously, a lot of those appearances being for Liverpool. Uh, he's won two league titles at City and a Champions League with Liverpool. And he is an absolute class player right now. Obviously, I don't know how good he was at Villa, but obviously, me seeing him at Liverpool, he's so good, isn't he? James Milner came to us as a, as a mid midfielder from Newcastle. Uh, he came on loan in 2005-06 season. Uh, was really impressive, young of course, but young, impressive player. Went back to Newcastle and came to us permanently in 2008. Three seasons in total with us and in 2010 he set off to Man City. They just got a whole lot of cash coming from the Middle East, you know how that went. They bought everybody in sight and they bought Mill, they gave us 25 million. So you know what, I suppose it's just one of those, one of those things, you lose a great player. But he was a great player. He gave everything, he played a lot of games, he scored goals, he, he contributed. He was, you know, he, he was a real class act of a player. Didn't get injured much, but he did put himself about. Um, and I said to him, leave. I think everybody was. But I suppose when a club, when a, a player has given so much to a club and then the time comes for him to earn a lot of money elsewhere, well, I suppose you can't be surprised, can you? I think most people would say one of the best players we've had in the last 10 years, for sure. And even now, I went to Liverpool. I forget when that was, but um, he, he's still there, still on their, 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 their books. Just shows you what a consistently good player he's been. Right, so the next player we're going to be talking about and getting into our last few, Aston Villa's fourth most expensive signing is Douglas Louise. Louise signed for Villa for £15 million on the 25th of July in 2019. Of course, we signed him from Man City. He's played 18 games and scored three goals this season. And Dougie, I don't really know. When Louise first came to Villa, obviously, we signed him in the transfer window this season and we signed a lot of midfielders. And there was a lot of competition. We had Grealish, McGinn, Nakamba, Louise... Uh, everyone wanting to start in that midfield spot. Louise got her first few starts of the season, played really well at the start of the season, scoring his first goal for Villa on his second game, or it might have been his debut debut against Bournemouth. What a screamer that was, and he looked like a very class player. We then started to play him throughout the season. Towards the middle of the season, he kind of dipped in form, and we gave Nakambra and McGinn more of a go, and uh, Louise kind of just sat on the bench for most of the season, and then recently he's starting to play more games, but once again, hasn't been an outstanding midfielder. We signed him from Man City, and Man City really did hype him up when he was there. He didn't make that many appearances, Man City, but the season before that, he spent the last two seasons on loan at Spanish like Granola making 46 appearances altogether for them. He was then planning to move back to Man City, but he got a work permit denied at Man City, which, you know, stopped him from...
from going there for some reason, I don't know what reason that is, but when he came to Villa, his work permit was granted and he signed for us. Once again, another hit and miss play, he's, he, oh, I just don't know, the start of the season he was class, everyone thought he was amazing, and then, and then Dean Smith kind of was put him on the bench most games and he hasn't really done much. He also scored a very important goal against uh, Watford, hit and miss player, mm, I don't really know, I don't, I don't really know what to say about him. Right guys, so we're coming into the last few players now and the uh, the, the player I'm going to be talking about now is the main man, Darren Bent, who Villa signed for £18 million. And I have got a lot to say about this guy because it sounds like Villa did not treat him right. Before we signed Ben, he played for Sunderland and he scored and he uh, played 58 games for Sunderland in, in the league and scored 32 goals. That's like one goal every two games, so you know that's a very good record, very good, respectable record. So we signed Ben for £18 million, which is quite a big deal at the time. And I think he seemed to have some issues, he seemed to have a lot of issues at Villa, especially towards the end of his career, because at the end of the Villa career, Villa were doing stuff like that they did not let Darren Ben into the chain the, the first team changing room at all. No idea why. Also, the last like year or so at Villa, he had to train with the under 21s because the Villa manager and everyone did not let him train with everyone else. He's not said why, but he said that Villa treated him bad. During his time at Villa, we sent him on loan, out on loan three times to Fulham, Brighton and Derby. So obviously the manager, whoever it was, did not like Darren Bent. He's come out and said after his Villa career that he really did not enjoy playing for Villa purely because of these experiences. I haven't seen him in a Villa top, so I'm going to let Grandad do the talking. But Villa, hopefully you've not done this to any other players, right? Darren Bent, your striker, came, came from Sunderland 2011. Cost £18 million. Pounds. £18 million when that was a lot of money. 54 games, scored 25 goals. And you'd, you'd have thought like he did done pretty well. But it was a bit chalk and cheese. Um, he didn't, some of the fans liked him, some didn't. And the strangest thing about all of it was that the managers and the training staff, they didn't really want to play him that, that much. Anyway, the point was, he didn't really come through. And I don't know why the reason for that was. Maybe the expectation of what was paid. Maybe he just didn't get on with the fans or the club. You know, one player can play well for one club, doesn't play well for another. Just at uh, uh, Torres, brilliant at Liverpool, poor at Chelsea, I think we'll all agree. So he didn't work out for Darren. Real shame. England international just didn't work out. Right, guys, so the next player I'm going to be talking about is the second to last player, and that is Wesley. I give Wesley stick, all the Villa fans give Wesley stick, but guys, listen to this, because when researching about this guy, I found some very good facts about him. First of all, when Wesley was nine years old, Wesley's dad died of brain tumour, which obviously, you know, isn't nice when you're so young, and that's what really pushed him to be a footballer. If you guys didn't know this, Wesley was actually a midfielder for the start of his career, and he would off and he was offered trials at Trekia or something like that in S S uh, Slovakia. Slovakia is a very cold place, and in training and playing matches, it was snowing, it was absolutely freezing cold. And obviously, Wesley's from Brazil, so he's obviously really not used to that weather. So obviously, that put him off here, you know, that put him off playing a lot. He then obviously went to Club Brugge and had a very very good season at Club Brugge, scoring 30 goals in two seasons, which is obviously pretty class. Also at Club Brugge, he spent four seasons there winning two titles. He won the best young player in the whole of Belgium uh, and in a Champions League game he scored two goals versus Monaco to help Club Brugge win that thing. So when he came to Villa he had a lot of potential and everyone was very excited being at the time the record transfer fee for Villa. And then I think we all know what happened, to be honest. Of course, all Villa fans know that Wesley's time at Villa has not been a success. He's been uh, injured for the majority of three months. Uh, where before he was injured, he was playing rubbish, just a fat lump at front, doing absolutely nothing. And everyone was getting frustrated at him. But he has had it hard in his life because I think he had a kid when he was like 16 or something. And then he had another one a few years later. No, he had a son when he was 15 and a daughter at 16. So obviously, 16 years old, he, you know, he, he's become a parent parent to two kids and also he's focusing on playing football I know it's quite a tough you know career or whatever he came to Villa did really bad I don't want to talk about that now because obviously you know how hard he's had it but his final game for Villa before he got injured was against Burnley I went and every single Villa fan knew how amazing Wesley played and we were all saying this is it this is the Wesley we know this is the Wesley we thought was gonna you know play at the start of the season he actually generally played amazing he scored two goals one was ruled off by VAR but he played amazing and then Wesley's look he gets injured for three months so I kind of do feel bad for Wesley now, obviously doing this research, but he he, he, uh, he signed for Villa for 22 million, Villa's second most uh, second most expensive player 
And yeah, up the big ways. Last player, we've got big boy Tyrone Mings. Mings' transfer is around 20 to 25 million. It could add up to 25 million. And of course, he came from the club Bournemouth. What a baller this guy is. I'll talk about my opinion on Mings uh, later on, but we've got some facts for you right now. Mings started off at Yate Town, his non-league club. He then was thinking about quitting football to, uh, to become a mortgage advisor, and that's what he did. He, uh, he, he went to his local team, Chippenham, uh, 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 while being a mortgage advisor and pulling pints down the bar. He then uh, went to Ipswich Town for 10k and he had a pretty good career at Ipswich. He, uh, he uh, won the league, he won Player of the Month and uh, was all around happy it looked like. He then went to Bournemouth a few years later, didn't really do loads of Bournemouth. And then of course he came to Villa on loan uh, in the Championship, really did help us. In the Championship he was by far the best defender in the Championship at the time and one of the best players in the league uh, in that Championship season. He then of course got promoted with us and uh, I've got a bit of an interesting story here. The night before kickoff for the Derby player final, we met Tyro Mings' dad in, the, uh, in a bar by the hotel and we said to him what's happening with Mings like what's going on he said they've got a contract ready for Mings if we get promoted if not he unfortunately probably won't join Villa so he said yes let's get promoted and Mings can be in the side of course we all know what happened Mings didn't sign a contract or nothing was announced for about three to four months and me and my mum were generally worried we were like oh yeah Mings is out to be inside Mings is out to the you know contract's ready and obviously he didn't do it so we were like panicking so much and then eventually he did which was just absolutely amazing but my opinions on Mings is a bit mixed. At the start of the season, he was class, sick defender that we all know. Towards the middle, I think he started making a lot of mistakes. This is the time around the England call. If he got called up for England, obviously that racism stuff happened with uh, Bulgaria. Then when he could return to Villa after that game, he kept making mistakes. Example, went to Man United away. He made him, He was just doing step overs in the box against Man United in our box. And obviously uh, Man United tackled it. A uh, Man United player tackled him and they scored. Stuff like that. Something happened with a, like, a few more other goals. And he was just making mistakes after mistake after mistake. People were doubting him. I think he got injured, but when he came back, or he might have just been dropped. I think he got dropped, and then he really started, you know, to take his career seriously again. He got back to the Mings we know and love. He's the only player I've ever seen in an England shirt, and hopefully by the Euros, Jack and Mings will be in the England squad full-time. I definitely think of Mings will, and hopefully Jack will. But... Mings, if he keeps his concentration and plays how you know he he, he you know how how he can, then he can definitely be a very big player and a sick defender in a few years. Right, guys, so there are Aston Villa's top 10 most expensive signings, but I also got my granddad to do a video about uh, striker Juan Pablo Angel. Uh, he's like the 12th or 11th most expensive Villa signing, so he's basically on the list anyway, but I thought I'd get my granddad to do a video about him because all the Villa fans apparently love him. So here's what my granddad has to say about Juan Pablo Angel. And now one of my favourite players, one of my favourite players of Villa Park ever, Juan Pablo Angel. Forward came to us from River Plate in 2001, nine and a half million, played 159 games, scored 62 goals and stayed with us till 2007 when he went to New York Red Bulls. I, I just loved JPA. I loved him. He was a most fantastic player. He was class all the way through. A real gentleman of a player. He was a bit slow off the blocks. He came to us in the January um, of, of that, that year, 2001. And um, he didn't actually score to the last game of the season, which was a game against Coventry. And you know what? He didn't score, but people stuck with him. People stuck with him right from the first day he arrived. That was a game we were 2-0 down. It was the last game of the season. Coventry had to win to stay up. Half-time, 2-0. And I think he scored the second of our three goals that we scored to send Coventry down. What a day that was. He was absolutely fantastic. And you know what? He went on to become a legend at Villa Park. And even today, when you ask people who their best players were in the last 10, 20 years, and you have the, uh, the fans' votes on players, Juan Pablo Angel is always going to be in that top five. Fantastic player. Absolutely. Real class. Anyway, guys, I think that is the end of the video. I hope you guys have enjoyed. Please like this video. It means so much. Also, vote for me in the FBAs. Please just bring this flipping trophy back home to Birmingham. Link will be in the top line description. Go vote for me. Uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Road to 10,000 subscribers. Uh, up the villa. And yeah.